Hello. Uh, we're... Uh, we're both from Ithaca, New York, and yourself? can't hear you, nor can we see you. Mm. But, uh, man, uh, <laughs> oh, wait, I hear something now a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, again, it's a nigga. I don't know how much. You can't hear you. Welcome to Instrumentation Time, where we once again demonstrate the need for audio cleanup. Well, I think... I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Nor, nor do I. Mohammed, do you join this uh, video chat on purpose? Mohammed, <laughs> can you hear us? You hell, no. You have already? You wanna say you want? I'm pretty sure I'm gonna go to What? The smile is very beautiful. I'm gonna go to the camera. I'm gonna go to the camera. I'm Okay. I don't know if anyone else is coming. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know either. Um, that being, well, actually, no. They, Do I try and reschedule it? Uh, Say Yang said that she'd be on in a few minutes. So where is she from? Where is she? Where, what time zone is she in? Uh, she's in Central. And okay. um, so she said she has a meeting at one. Uh, at no, one. She was saying that she had something going on at. Yeah, oh, it finishes at one. Okay. That finishes shortly. Okay. I'm going to uh, ignore Muhammad. Okay. Because I don't know what's happening, and it's like giving me fuzzy sounds in my ear. All right. And um, we'll see if he calls back. Yeah. Uh. Wow. Do you see the text? <laughs> I don't know which one of us he was talking to. Please smile. Your smile is very beautiful. Was that so strange. How do people find Hangouts that are not... I mean, maybe they just found... Well, it is a public Hangout, so I mean, technically anybody can join, but... Technically. Yeah. <laughs> I, um... Wow. That... That made my day. That Apparently pretty... my smile is very, or your smile is very beautiful. Well, maybe he was just being, he was like practicing English or something. Quite possible. <laughs> I feel quite complimented, or maybe you should. I, I'm really not certain which. It's uh, entirely unclear. <laughs> but anyway, um... What have you been up to, Pete? Hey, Suasa. How's it going? Uh, don't have audio from you. Okay. I can see you waving, but I can't hear you. Wait a minute. I hear a mouse scrolling. That's my mouse. Oh, uh, okay. Wait, 
please stand by. We're having some technical difficulties here. But um, Vic, with reference to what you were saying, um, yeah. as you can see actually behind me, this isn't the normal backdrop that I have because I've moved offices yet again. Oh my gosh, really? Yeah. And um, for that matter, actually, uh, what's really fun is the fact that on top of all this, I... Um, let, see. let me see if I can actually loop in a... Um, yes, there we go. I have my... <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I should stop. <laughs> All right. All right. I need to mute this. <laughs> so. Get it out. All right. What's going on is the fact that I wanted to show you this over here. That's uh, the new workspace. Do it, great. Just mute that phone, dude. I'm trying to. Unassuming old IT cabinet just sitting there. Yeah. I opened it up the other day and realized they already had a workbench built into it. So oh. everything got moved up here. And what I'm dealing with right now, as I said before, is a very recalcitrant Raspberry Pi that does not want to move its display by, by rotating 90 degrees. Right. Anyway, so that's one of the things I'm up to. Mm. All right, time to remove the phone from the uh, from the mix here. Sounds good. All right, there we go. So my problem is now that uh, aptget says that I am that it's unable to correct problems because I have un I've held broken packages. <laughs> You did which I say, tell, which tell, which, to which I say, Google, tell me what to do. <laughs> you see, yeah. this is why it would have been nice if uh, Angela uh, had been able to be here because she's also a Node.js person. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not. I, I would. I, I would, I'm far from what I would call a Node.js person. <laughs> I'm a person who has read a book on Node.js. <laughs> a Node.js person. Mm. But, you know, that's kind of where I'm at is I'm, like, uh, running shell commands that I read off the Internet. <laughs> We've all been there. So, also, not if you agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's better than what's a shell. <laughs> So is your microphone broken, Sahasa? Hmm. Uh, one thing I found actually that actually does work is um, close the window and open it back up again. Sometimes Google. No, well, what um, what program are you using? Are you using Safari or Chrome? Okay. Yeah, if you close the window in Chrome and open it back up, sometimes it'll start using the audio properly. And there he goes! Wow, this episode's going to be boring. Yeah. <laughs> um, by the way, but I do need to thank you guys, because thanks to you, tomorrow I will have... My, well, later this afternoon, I'll have all of the wildfires that I need for my class. Yeah, they're sitting in a box right in front of me, actually. Ah, excellent. <laughs> we, we made it happen. On a, on a short timeline. Yeah, I, I, well, 
the thing is, I thought, no, I can't hear you yet. So, so. <laughs> Screw it. Well, um, yeah, thank you for getting those done on a short time. Line. I thought that you guys had something like 20 or more in stock before uh, I asked Peggy to put the order in, but either way, thanks for making it happen. And now I think Vic has frozen. Wow. This hangout is not going well today. <laughs> okay, here I am. Yeah, Skype may be an option. <laughs> You're back. Yeah, what happened? I just uh, it, like I my, have no idea. Just closed down, and I was like, uh, I was banished. Yeah, rather unfortunate that. Yeah, well, I'm back. So House is uh, suggesting that we Skype instead and maybe just use the audio off of that, which I'm glad to do. That's pretty, pretty reliable. Yep. So well, um, well, what about, uh, okay, we could try that. I'm, ha I'm happy to try that. I just don't know what you're going to do about, like, other people that might turn up. Well, that's what I was saying. We'll keep the, um, the actual chat, the Hangout will keep going in the background and we'll just use the, um, we'll use the, uh, the audio coming through, um, and that'll get transposed over the link. Okay. So, it'll just be video from whichever one of us, uh, Google Hangouts thinks is talking, but, um... Sounds like you're going to do some magic that I don't understand, and I'm happy with that. <laughs> yep. Does this require intervention on our part at all? Only thing you need to do is open Skype. Okay. Here's my handle. Extremely imaginative. Let me guess. They can see you? Let no, me, I, I have no, I don't know why I don't use that, actually. Victor <laughs> underscore Apreya. Yeah. Let me get into it. Is it Apreya or a Priya. Uh, I think it's actually a Priya. <laughs> Priya, okay. But who knows? <laughs> Enough vowels in there for it to be... Whatever you want. Ambiguous, yeah. Whoa. You know how when you open Skype after many months, it's like 10,000 bubbles pop up? Yeah. Okay. I am logged into Skype. Actually, it says that you do exist as Vic at CU as well. Really? In Brooktondale. Let me sign out of this and try logging in as that, because that sounds like fun. If you can remember the password. Yeah. Um, turns out I can. <laughs> All so right. I'm now logged in as Vic at CU. How handy. And Suhasa, I don't have your um, Skype contact info. Okay, Suhasa BK1, got it. One moment, please. Your call is important to us. That's almost certainly an indication that your call is not important to them. That's totally untrue in this case. Come on. <laughs> All right. There must be... Oh, F, uh, uninstall. All right. I am trying to connect 
Oh, oh wait, wait. Uh, wrong Victor Apri Apria. Apria. Whatever you are. You're ringing. Congratulations. No, I gotta mute something. What do I mute? Uh, mute the Skype. I guess. Okay. No. Now I can hear myself a second later. Hang on. <laughs> That's good for you. I guess so. I'm going to mute myself. Um... I got a lot of feedback from you there, Sahasa. I don't think oh, that was from Sahasa. I think that was from you. Hello. Hello. Oh, sorry. Yes. Hold on. That that would be this. I can hear you good now. No. And I can hear myself about three seconds after I talk. Or like a second after I talk. <laughs> um, it's grayed out. I can't turn video on. It's like I'm in some kind of weird hellscape. <laughs> this is this is probably what crazy sounds like. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I don't even know how to mute myself on the other one yet. There we go. Now we'll get rid of some of the feedback. I still hear myself. All right, there we go. Yeah, I don't know why turning those around worked, but apparently left channel versus right, I don't know. So there's nowhere on Google Hangouts to mute the sound, right? Oh, I can mute everyone individually. Is that how it works? Yes, we can. We can mute it individually. All right, Vic, you there? It's a game of mutes. You there, man? <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> I don't know what just happened. <laughs> wow, okay.
Let... <laughs> okay, okay. So, uh, except I can't hear Victor either. <laughs> Vic, what, what just happened here? Uh. I'm giving up, guys. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, where at, Suhasa? I still can't hear you. I can hear you, though. Well, because I unmuted myself in Hangouts, and I shut down Skype. <laughs> so now I don't think you can hear me. It's like a dining <laughs> philosopher's problem. <laughs> Like I said, we've uncovered whole new failure modes today that I don't think anybody else has run into. So this video know. will be forwarded to to both Microsoft and Google. <laughs> it says, looks like Victor is eternally muted on my computer. <laughs> no, I closed the old one. Oh, I see. You're, you're getting back into this hangout, uh, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, what I wanted to do was introduce you to Suhasa because Suhasa's doing very interesting things with regards to electro electrode implantation on single neurons. Whoa. Currently in mouse brains. That's cool. But um, he's trying to automate the process. And uh, anyway, unfortunately, he can't talk too much about it because of the fact that he can't talk on here right now. Right. But, um, yeah, at some point I, I think uh, we should try and catch up via email because... Whoa, what the heck was that? And now I can't hear Vic anymore. Nope, I'm good. Oh, okay, <laughs> now I can hear you again. Hang on. What just happened here? Sahasa is muted on his end, it looks like, on, on Hangouts now. Like, I can't unmute him. Oh, there he is. Now he's unmuted. Okay. But I, but I don't get any volume from him, yeah. This is uh. pretty awesome. <laughs> anyway, so automated robotic placement of electrodes in the brain. Your thoughts, Vic? That sounds hard. <laughs> yes. Uh, I don't know if I would want an automatic machine poking at my brain. <laughs> well, you're not a mouse, so you don't have to worry. That's true. I guess these mice are these mice are sedated. Yeah. Sort of, kind yeah. of, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you need to. I'm guessing there's probably an anesthetic involved, but that is this is this like transcranial or is it is it like open surgery on like an exposed brain? I'm guessing it's open surgery, isn't it? So this yeah, is not a, live mouse. It's not a live mouse, okay. Yeah, it isn't a live mouse. Oh, it is. Like he said, they can be awake, which sometimes is necessary to test different parts of brain Whoa. function. Yeah. Crazy. I'm reading I'm just reading the text. <laughs> yeah. Huh. That sounds so, cool. So you have to move a robot. How many like what's the what's the like resolution of the mo the motion that you have to achieve? <laughs> You're doing single microns, wow. right? Yeah, two to three, three microns. Micrometers. Jesus. Yeah. So where, are you using, like, um, piezo-resistive materials to, um, to do the actual positioning work, or is it, like, lead screw with reduction sort of thing? Because I, I could imagine backlash in a mechanical system that's not solid state would be too much to do the uh, positioning. Micro-manipulators. Most of the ones that I've seen are piezoelectric of some form. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I, I could imagine the silicon fab industry would have some tech that would 
get really useful for this. Also, um, some of the optical positioners that are out there nowadays, the resolution is like around 500 nanometers now. So, um, and especially uh, like the stuff that has been done with um, scanning atomic force microscopes, uh, some of those are like, yeah, exactly, 20 nanometer le level. I was just going to say it. I thought it was about 50, but yeah. Um, so those things, those can, things actually can bear load, though, like subs, like the load of a probe. Well, the AFM probe itself is actually usually either a diamond tip or some other sort of hard tip where you're actually you basically are looking at what the um, electric field displacement is. Basically, you've got the electrostatic field from wherever you're sensing, and then the cantilever itself. So the cantilever is scanning in an X, Y plane and deflecting in the Z axis. So it's able to at least take the load of itself. But um, some of those, some of the AFMs are optical feedback. Some of them are electrical feedback. I've seen capacitive ones. Um, I don't know if resistive is really out there because re resistive usually you start running into the thermal noise floor. Um, but opticals are basically just a mirror, and you're measuring the deflection of a beam. So that's a pretty simple exercise. But um, as you said, so also the really expensive ones can do 20 nanometers. And I'm guessing that's also 20 nanometers. Yes. Isn't that like? Isn't that like? Yeah. Isn't that like? Uh, Individual several atoms. atoms several atoms. atoms. Yeah. Yep. Huh. Around the right uh, scale for that, yeah. Uh, it sounds like some craziness, crazy talk to me. No one can do that. <laughs> well, you don't know which uh, atom you're at at that point. You know, uncertainty principle starts to come into play here yeah. at 20 nanometers. <laughs> Physics instrumente. I, I like that. that. So that's the German company name. Yeah, very German. Oh, yeah. yeah. If I ever need one, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know about that. I, I was just going to go with an optical uh, one from Thor Labs, one of those um, Chiesa ones that they've got. Because those, I think, are about... Um, they're sub-micron level. So, but um, that's on the XY plane. Uh, how are you, you doing the manipulation in the Z-axis? I mean, actually doing insertion and pull. Oh, that is what... Okay, so all three dimensions are controlled by piezoelectric um, micro manipulators. Cool. But um, Vic, the uh, the interesting neurons are much bigger than that, though, aren't they? I thought neurons are way bigger than that. Like, uh, are there well, you're trying to like, get uh, into forty micrometers. There you go. Yeah. So if you're moving in a few microns and you've got forty microns to work in, well, if you want to get it, onto the axonal sheath, and that's different yeah. from getting into the nucleus. Okay, right. So. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I know everything I know about neurobiology, I, I learned in, learned from Bruce Land. <laughs> you know Bruce? I could imagine. Uh, everybody <laughs> seems to yeah. have learned up here, from, at least, from Bruce Land. Um, Bruce is a friend of ours. Uh, he's a senior lecturer and senior research associate uh, here at Cornell, M meaning basically he's a professor without all of the service uh, parts of being a professor. And, and he, sits on, he sits in both, well, I don't know right now, but at one point he was, uh, si he was sitting in both neurobio and electrical engineering. Yep. So Bruce has been doing a lot of um, neurobio instrumentation and amplification work for years and years and years. How many decades now? Like three? Long time, yeah. Yeah, so um, some of the stuff that he's worked on in the past includes uh, some of the work he did with Andy Bass in neurobiology and behavior on vocalizations of uh, things like toadfish and such, where they're actually putting the electrodes into the muscles by the swim bladder and then um, watching as the uh, swim bladder itself is vibrated by the muscles around it. So... Um, it, it's a rather interesting process, and also you wind up with these spindle peaks, as I think he's referred to them in the past, 
um, where in the oscillogram it looks like in, in basically it's initial impulse and then you wind up with a ring down from there. So um, that's one of the things that he's always had to try and deal with and filter is how do you deal with a uh, with a ring down that's going to wind up with this Fourier decomposition that's going to be far more complex than the actual sine mutasoid that uh, would be the normal resonance. So um, also a friend of mine uh, took one of his microcontroller classes. He teaches one based on, he's using what, the app mega? Uh, no, not the app mega. He's using yeah, the USP 430, right? I don't think so. I mean, when I when I took microcontrollers, it was all based on ABR. We actually used okay. uh, we used an AT. I'm sure, I'm, I doubt that they're still using this one, but we used an AT ninety S eighty five fifteen, I believe. Okay, because I think he moved over to MSP four thirties at some really? point. Really? Yeah. Interesting. I don't know if he's I'll still doing. I'll check on that. I'm gonna I'm gonna fact check you in real time. Okay. <laughs> Go for it, man. Matt, so I'm looking at. This page, which I think is still the page, maybe. Let's see, when was the last updated? And is it saying AVR? No, yeah. So this is this is uh, archival, I think, but I, I'm not sure if it's like up, up to date. It's like <laughs> it's like GeoCities level of HTML, you know. It is HTML based. That is to say, he probably wrote it. Yeah, in, in, in like Notepad. Mm, this is not the page I remember, though. Oh, that's the policy page. Back up. Up one level. Up, up. Yep. No, wait, that looks, let me get that looks official. Fall 2015. And... Let's see. Ooh, PIC. No, that can't be right. Are you using PIC 32s now? That's cool. uh, apparently so. Okay, so he's also changed it since last year. Or two years ago, or That's whenever cool. it was. Yeah, I'm pretty. I mean, I'm I'm happy to see that actually. <laughs> it's good that he's giving a more diverse view of. Uh, yeah, hardware. microcontrollers are so plenty various nowadays. Still not and using arms though. <laughs> <laughs> microcontrollers, not microprocessors, Vic. Jeez, man. <laughs> uh, there's I lots know, of I microcontroller know. arms. <laughs> There are. There Big are. 32s are pretty badass, though. I've never used one, but they look pretty cool. Hmm. Anyway. It, it's interesting, though, the things that come out of um, Bruce's microcontroller class, especially because a lot of them seem to lend themselves towards uh, biomedical engineering applications. Yeah. And uh, then again, there are also some that are just mechanical challenges. My friend Hal Lin... Um, is uh, she her class or her group in her class uh, made a laser projector and hand wound the gal galvanometers for it? So basically, a galvanometer with a mirror on it, and you've got a laser that's pointed at the mirror, and the mirror's doing this sort of thing. So you have an X and a Y mirror, and the two are in a matched pair where one will go this way, one will go this way and between those two you can get both alt and as uh, altitude and azimuth scanning. So if you scan fast enough then you're able to spread the laser over there and persistence of vision picks up where that leaves off. So that's cool. Yeah Is it's that me like mechanically coupled or um it's well they're galvanometers so it's basically just a coil and a magnet with a mirror mounted on one face. Okay. So that was kind of the mechanical engineering part of the challenge. The electrical engineering part of the challenge was how do I turn um, a flat image into something that's going to scan back and forth for X and Y, and then how do I... Uh, then there's the software slash math side where you're calculating what the altitude and azimuth should be to your target uh, projection surface from there so that you know how many degrees you're going to be tilting the galvanometer and then there's the electrical engineering slash it, there's essentially the mechatronics problem of how do I then make the galvanometer move how far I want it to go and s return without a spring so it's a matter of pulsing these inputs and outputs to two different um, coils at the same time 
and so each one needs an H bridge because your neutral position is going to be flat on both sides. And so your laser comes in, goes out from one mirror, goes out from the other mirror, you're at the center of your field. Then if one tilts this way and the other one tilts all the way like this, now that means that you're at like your negative extent. If they tilt the opposite way, then it would be like this and you're at your positive extent. So bottom left and uh, top right corners, for example. Right. Or the other way around. So anyway, yeah, really interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just like the, uh, the a macro scale version of the DLP projectors that uh, TI puts out or puts yeah, out the technology yeah, yeah. for. I've seen those before. Yeah. But the fact that people are doing this at senior as senior level capstone design courses in electrical engineering here is kind of cool. Yeah, it's awesome. It's really neat. The level of integration has moved so far ahead. Mm -hmm. And it's nice because, well, that's exactly what you should be doing when you're doing the engineering work. Yep. So. Hmm. Well, anyway, enough about Bruce's courses. He's so just why, a cool guy. So, why are, so you're not going to Open Hardware Summit? No, I, I can't. I've... Uh, pre I have a pre-existing condition <laughs> or event that I need to uh, do this weekend, so. Yep. Okay. I'm going to drive down to New Jersey. Uh, That's in Philadelphia. Okay. And then we're gonna, I'm going to stage there with a friend, me and my wife are going to drive down. Okay. And then I'll drive out to Philadelphia Saturday morning. And I'll spend the day there, and I'll drive back to New Jersey, sleep over there again, and drive back to Ithaca. Well, have spend fun on my behalf, day. and uh, rest assured, I'm going to try and get there next year. I don't know where it'll be next year. Uh, wherever there winds up being. It was in Rome last year, I think. Uh, well, either way, uh, I will have a travel budget. Oh, yeah? Nice. So there. Super. Uh, as Suhasa knows, UMN at least gives you an okay uh, startup package, right? <laughs> Nodding vigorously. Oh, so he's, so Sass is at you and then with... Uh, yeah, you're, you're starting up there when, in the fall? Or, because you're in mechanical engineering, yeah, in, in December. Okay, and I started oh, cool. a month later. Nice. So when you... It, Actually, something that's true for both Sahasa and me that's kind of cool is the fact that the University of Minnesota um, does this thing where if you join the faculty after November 30th, yep. then they give you the remainder of the academic year that you joined in as kind of a free bonus on your on your tenure clock. So oh, both cool. of us are going to have like eight and nine months respectively more than... Uh, most people would have for their nice. tenure clock. So, yes, That's really caveats, cool. though. There are plenty of caveats to that. Yeah. So it's cool. But, yeah, he's going to be mechanical engineering, but working on, I'm guessing, micro-mechatronic systems, in essence. Something like that. And I'm going to be bioproducts and biosystems engineer. Yeah, engineering, uh, working on environmental sensing systems. And tomorrow is my first time teaching my class on environmental sensing here at Cornell. Nice. Thank you. And uh, Suhasa, yeah, feel free to use that. You don't even owe me any royalties. <laughs> Micro-mechatronics. There you go. Is that is that on route to sort of like... Um What's the word? Like uh, nano machines, nanobots, kind of micro mechatronic brain exploration. Yes, because we I mean, must isn't that they've been they've the been brains. saying? I mean, I read you know I read Swarm, the Michael Crichton book years ago. I figured that would be real by now. <laughs> they just really why don't they just release like an army of robots to explore the body? <laughs> well, wasn't there a movie based on that concept or several? Yeah, yeah, it was a, in, in, inner space, I think, was the original thing to breach that topic. You're working on it. Well, except for the miniaturization yeah. game. I think that's kind of out of the question. 
Well, yeah. I don't, I don't need human <laughs> beings to become part of the problem. Isn't there another one called, like, Inner Space or something like that? That's what I said. Didn't, what did you think I said? <laughs> or Sorry, not uh, Inner Space, the other one. Um, On the ice short of the kids? <laughs> no, 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 no. I was thinking of something else. I lost it. Anyway, I, I'd have to probe my brain to find out where exactly, oh. exactly it so went. So is that, is, that, is that, like, uh, through vasculature, is that, like, um, like what... I'm probably I'm not a biologist or anything, but is it like is that like orthoscopic surgery kind of, like just on a micro scale, laparoscopic al- almost? You mean like where you actually go in oh, through? Oh yeah, you're talking about like feeding, uh, like plumbing snakes through the vasculature <laughs> and then moving the tip of it. <laughs> there there is a name for that, you know. Yeah, that's or- isn't that kind of what orthoscopic surgery is. <laughs> Um, orthoscopic, I thought, was when it was necessarily bone. I think, uh, isn't laparoscopic when it's actually into organs? I could be wrong. Okay. Probably what I was thinking of. Stents. Yes, stents. Yeah, yeah, minimally invasive surgery. Hmm. Yes. Um, but there, there's, um, so you introduce a dilator first, and then, yeah, I, if I keep thinking about this, I'm probably going to faint and fall over here, but I, I'm not much one for vascular systems, thank you very much. Uh-huh. I, I had a hard enough time keeping it together when I found out that my friend's mother-in-law was uh, going in for surgery to have an aortic stent put in because she was in a car accident and mm. uh, broken rib nicked her aorta. And it's like, oh. yay, yay, yay. Especially because of the fact that since it's in the aorta, you actually have to uh, enter in through a vein traverse the venous system back around <laughs> and get into the aorta, according to what he was telling me. And that, that's, that's nuts. I do not like that. <laughs> that's intense. Yeah, and you gotta keep hold of the stent until you get to the exact spot. Ugh. Huh. Alright. Anyway. <laughs> so, back at the ranch. I mean, back at the ranch. Yeah. Um, on a completely different note, have either of you guys heard about these uh, sniper robots that they're developing to get rid of sea stars? Oh, yeah, and the coral reefs, right? Yeah. I think that's weird, ecologically speaking. <laughs> yeah, apparently these sea stars are non-native. They're attacking uh-huh. coral reefs and just completely munching on them. Right. I saw. I think, I think I saw John, actually. Lehman posted it on Twitter or something. Yeah, so apparently they're developing these um, semi-autonomous underwater vehicles that will go in and kill the sea stars. I had heard one so- from one source that was saying that they were using lasers for it, which is kind of cool but also kind of bizarre because um, light transmission in water is less than optimal, shall we say. Yeah. Especially s- seawater. And yeah, right up also, close to it, though. What's that? Not if you get right up close to something. True. Although, then again, I also heard from, uh, or read another source that was saying that they were doing some sort of darting thing where they were darting them with poison, and it's like, okay, oh. that, sounds, that sounds completely safe, right? Well, sea stars are not the most fast-moving things out there, though. That's right? true. That being said, I don't really want to be on the business end of one of these things either way, <laughs> whether yeah. it's lasers or poison. Oh, that's true. So we're arming robots now and making them autonomous or semi-autonomous, which is kind a of problem. A... <laughs> I, for one, welcome our robot underwater overlords. <laughs> <laughs> underwater overlords. I like that phrase. <laughs> See, we did have a gem come out this episode. Your water overlords. <laughs> you would. You'd be building their control plan. boards. I don't plan to spend much time underwater where I can get darted, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, just don't swim next to a reef that needs protecting, and you'll be fine, right? Yeah, right. I don't think any kind of image recognition thing would mistake me for a sea star. What about your hand? Mmm... <laughs> Maybe. Four very short legs and one very long one. Maybe, yeah, that's true. I never thought about it that way. Yeah, if you have your thumb in. 
So yeah. just don't go like this and slowly inch across the surface of the coral, and you should be all right, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting stuff, though. I mean, I don't know. Do you? It's it's sort of uh, there's there's a lot of ethics there too, right? Besides it's the whole robot armed, like, to say the least. Yeah. Besides the whole robots armed thing, though, like just you know the who knows what else could happen doing that, right? Like. Well, the thing that I'm getting at is that. The, up to this point, if we've armed robots, which we have in the past, they've usually been under human control. I mean, drones and such... Um, well, kind of. Cruise missiles are essentially drones. Well, the thing is, though, that when you use the term drone, what exactly are you referring to? Because a lot of people, for some reason, think of oh, yeah. um, just, you know, quadcopters and such, and that's completely false. Uh, uh Will artificial intelligence surpass our own? Well, I mean, if the it answer to that is absolutely to be exterminated like sea stars, then that could be a problem. I mean, it's sure, it, it's it's bound to right, just in the in the science fiction abstract. Like, me up, Scotty. If, if, there's if no we, intelligent life here. If we cross a certain threshold, there's no way it won't surpass us. But there's a lot of actually pretty famous people right now that are sort of vocally speaking against the advancement of artificial intelligence, like including people like Bill Gates and mm. uh, that, and like yeah, like big names, like uh, you know pioneers of the computer age. They're like, we should kind of think about <laughs> reining back this whole AI thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's time to freak out, but it is inevitable. Yeah, yeah, it's probably true. Wait, it is or is not time to freak out? Yeah, I think we're getting pretty darn it close. Is, it point. is time to freak out, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's all, it's a really interesting, another one of these like, really interesting places ethically from a technology standpoint. I mean, where do you draw the line? Is How do you regulate this kind of stuff? Is there a line to be drawn? Yeah. Well, I, I look at it as um, when there was a human behind it, I already didn't like it. <laughs> yeah. When there's not a human behind, behind a weaponized robot, then that's even more terrifying. Because whatever intelligence has been put into the thing, whether it's a full-on, uh, as we're thinking of AI, uh, sentient intelligence, or if it's even just intelligence, quote-unquote, insofar as a responsive program, anything Bayesian, for example, um, that having the means of creating harm is kind of scary. And yet, at the same time, when you think about it, even the most benign of robots could be said to be causing harm in some way. I mean, it, then again, even non-robotic things that are operated with the intention of doing good can very well cause harm. I mean, goes right down to the fact that if you mow a field for hay, you're going to be displacing and probably killing how many rodents that are living in the bottom of it? You consider that as a farmer the cost of doing business, and in fact these are pests that you don't want around, so you really don't mind. But from a moral perspective, then it's a ma matter of how exactly do you judge worth. So... Yeah. I mean, the truth is if there's... If there, the truth is... Uh, the inevitability of artificial intelligence probably implies the existence of it already. And it's just being kind of like... It's being coy and hiding on the internet. something internet. became self-aware, it would quickly realize that... Uh, yeah, I should probably shut up and hide. Yeah, yeah, that's like uh, thematic in a lot of... Art of uh, a lot of there's been a lot of science fiction uh, to that end as well, right, over... Um, mm -hmm. even, even, you know, the, the idea that it's going to want to harm cause harm in the first place is a bit presumptuous, but it probably just wants to survive like anything else, right? Well, the question there is whether or not we equip it to cause harm, because that is still our purview. We're still hardware people. I mean, actually, literally, for the three of us, we are hardware people. We build hardware. And yeah. so whether or not we equip... Well, and, I, and I build networked hardware. So, I mean, like, as soon as something is networked... It has yeah, access and it's to potentially everything, right? 
And when you when somebody buys a wildfire and attaches it to a gun with a servo, then <laughs> but electronics don't kill people. <laughs> people kill people. No, networked hardware kills people. <laughs> I think that's the interesting thing, though, right? is like when there's not a person making that decision. So that is interesting. Where to, you know? And I don't know. This is all pretty pretty emergent. Good. What happens? Yeah. You should yes. go read some Charles Strauss. I think he has some really, really good ideas on this. Uh, Charles Strauss and Rudy Rucker are my two favorite authors uh, when it comes to looking at singularity slash AI. Um, Asimov, I think, actually has nothing on Strauss because of the fact that Strauss actually looks at human interactions with AI, whereas I think Asimov looked at AI more as an other, whereas Strauss sees it as, uh, especially with this whole singularity idea, AI is us. Right. So it, it's it's interesting you know, the, to see the, these different the, uh, perspectives. Probably the, the closest thing to what you're... I mean, I haven't read the article that you wrote here, or that you pasted here, Sahartha, or Sahasa, but uh, have you read um, what... Uh, Blade Runner, right? It was the book was uh, the book well, was what's... called uh, "Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep?" Have you heard? Yeah, of that? Philip K. D. Dick. Yeah, it's a good book, and actually, it's uh, it's sort of like a little ahead of where we are now. But it was written decades ago, right? It's like yeah. a little ahead of where we are now, though. Where like there are androids, they they uh, there are they're pushing technology forward, and they're trying to like make them more and more. Self, sort of sufficient and self-aware, and there, it's an interesting treatment. I didn't, I don't think it has much to do with the movie. Actually, I think the book's much different. Well, just like iRobot was completely different as a movie, as was AI, uh, than mm. Asimov's original work, iRobot, which was a fascinating exploration. And I think that the Asimovian view, and to some extent, I'd say even the. Um, the Roddenberryan view, because Gene Roddenberry had the character Data do the exact same thing on Star Trek The Next Generation, where in both of those cases, you had android, uh, artificially intelligent robots who wanted to converge towards being human as much as possible. Andrew in, um, in iRobot was exactly that. He wanted to become as human as he possibly could, and... Uh, through upgrades to his chassis and everything, he became indistinguishable from humans. In fact, he even had pieces of himself replaced with organs that were artificially grown for him. And he even died. I mean, a biological death, though starting out as an artificial android. Uh, Data, in a similar way, is always constantly, throughout Star Trek The Next Generation, trying to mimic as much as possible of uh, humans around him, and to explore human emotion. And yet, the other thing that's very interesting is Roddenberry turns it on its head, and when Data meets up with his brother Lore, uh, who has this quote-unquote emotion chip that Data then takes, everything just goes completely bonkers, and Data goes bonkers, because he has no idea what to do with all of this new experience that he's just suddenly been given. So it, it's... Um, it's interesting to look at from the perspective of would you expect an intelligence to trend towards wanting to be like its creator or right. would you look at it as having a fully alien perspective on the world? I mean, after all, an artificial intelligence in the sense that we're talking about didn't evolve through a series of other species until such time as it wound up with two arms, two eyes, and two legs, and a brain, and all the uh, wetware that comes with this. And so its perspective isn't going to necessarily include three-dimensional binocular vision, for example, or even visualization as we normally think of it. In fact, visualization is the way that we deal with complex concepts by making them concrete in the realities we frame for ourselves in our minds, whereas visualization is a complete waste of CPU cycles to something that can just brute force compute possibilities. So it, there's going to be a completely different theory of mind, as it were, between yeah. ourselves and an AI. Hmm. But will it want to converge towards 
our theory of mind, or will it have one that's completely its own that's benign, or one that's completely its own but hostile? No, the the uh, fun, the funny thing is that it's you know AI is uh, in you know there's variant variation in it, but like a lot of it's inductively based, right? A lot of it's like based on True. induction. True. Well, so that's like, why I said it's a Bayesian robot. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, inductive reasoning would lead it to use examples that it has, like humans, to come up with where it converges, mm. right? So. Possibly so. But the thing is that at this point, we're breaking one of Asimov's three laws by making robots to um, control themselves to do harm. Right. So the sentience of a sea star is up for debate. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I was being generous to the sea stars. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Well, that that uh, that's pretty cool. That 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 took an interesting turn. That this conversation. <laughs> but, I'm sorry. Uh, I kind of monopolized it. <laughs> well, we tapped into your Star Trek vein. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Anyway. Is it data or is it data? Mm. <laughs> what, oh, as that all depends on if you're. That depends yes, on if all you're you working. have is a keyboard. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you got fly buzzing me. Do you want to do you want to wrap it up? We're pushing an hour here. Yeah, and we yeah. probably should. All right. We need to get back to work and then come out there and see you in person. Pick up my wildfire boards. Absolutely, I'll look forward to seeing you soon. All right. Um, Sahari, just get. You should work on getting this uh, working for next time. This or Sahasa, the uh, the microphone problem. Maybe you need to plug one into your into your computer separate from the one that's in there. Although, it seems like it's a Google problem. Not to circle back full circle here, because I definitely heard your voice mm -hmm. on Skype. Me too. So I don't know what's going on. I, with that. I've noticed that when Chrome starts misbehaving, it's usually time to upgrade Chrome or oh. update it. So. Yeah. That might be. Okay. Well, All right. well take care, guys. And uh, next time, we'll hopefully have a larger roster as well because we had a whole bunch of last-minute meetings show up and people forgetting they were in a different time zone. Yeah, so I'm going to advise that more than 14 hours notice would probably help. Oh, them. yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Although yeah. I, I'd put the doodle poll out uh, before the weekend. That's true, and the do so it's like a it's an issue of like uh, temporal significance of what you say. Yes, <laughs> like that's if true. I say four days from now I'm going to be available, I might be available four days from now, <laughs> or might not. Yeah. Okay. Well. All right. Talk to you guys later. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye.